Legion Games, baby! I couldn't resist two days in a row, you know? So we just went with it. Again, if you know, you know. If not, you have no clue what I'm doing or talking about, and that's completely okay as well. Uh, let's talk about what's coming up in the next week, because again, like just like this past week where a ton of stuff launched, some that we knew, some we don't, there's a ton of stuff that we know that is launching this upcoming week, and this is going to have a lot of eyes on it. This is going to be a very expensive month if it hasn't been already for you. Like I said before in last week's video, this is going to be worse than August or July. It just is, because there's stuff across the board for everybody, not just like one or two big niche games. So that's just what's going to happen. You just need to be aware of it. Now we're going for 5k by the end of 2021. Also, hopefully tomorrow, I will have a special uh, one year anniversary video coming out. So tune in if you're interested from that side of things, something completely uh, different. <laughs> it's not gonna be very long. It's completely different though. So take that for what you will. Either a turn on or a turn off little tease right there uh so that's all i got you know those are my goals right now um i'm gonna get over my social anxiety as several of you commented on the last video in terms of the my collection of what happened in august about doing collaborations so i'm gonna get over uh being socially anxious online uh because i'm less so actually in person surprisingly not uh i'm Clearly not very much on these videos in terms of, like, doing them in front of the camera, but, like, having to message people and, like, put myself out there on, like, text, Twitter, email is, like, terrifying. Terrifying. So, we'll see where that goes. Um, but let's take a look at what is upcoming next week, what you need to know about those games, and my thoughts and or concerns about them already in advance. So, let's do this. First up, we have Omball Tournament, and this is a two to four player sort of mage-esque dueling game that, as you can obviously imagine, just based on the artwork alone. Now, now they've got their own website as well that dives into it a little bit. Uh, they're getting a much heavier presence on social media. I think this is the second or third relaunch for them, and I've said this before, in this mage, Magic the Gathering-like dueling games where you're throwing in deck construction and asymmetric factions and abilities, the market is highly saturated. It's oversaturated, to be fair. And I, I don't know. I mean, this is one of those where you kind of look at it and go, why didn't it fund? I, I, I don't know. I don't have a good reason. I don't know if it was price point. It's obviously not artwork. I mean, artwork is fantastic. Is it mechanics? Is it, you know, what is it that doesn't make some of these fund and some of these do fund? And this is one of those where I kind of shrug and go, I don't really know. They're offering what, like 100 cards, I think, in this base set of foundation. There are a couple videos out from everything up to two years ago to 24 days ago. And you can check it out. I mean, like it says, 100 cards of the first set. 1v1, 2v2. Each card is a skill. Physically, spells, or abilities that you're going to be utilizing. So, I mean, I don't know. There's enough information out there that there shouldn't be any ambiguity about whether or not you like it from that side of things. Simultaneous play. Again, high replayability, they say. So, battle phase. Play a card, flip it up, though. I mean, are you liking that style of things? Now, it looks like, as well, with this sort of tableau, you're going to be laying out heroes that are going to have successive abilities that are going to play off of each other. And, again, do you like that sort of thing? And... That's what you need to know. Now, there's no duplicates, which is also very interesting of these 100 cards. And you have one, two, three, four easily distinguishable factions. So 25 cards per faction that are unique. Again, that's something a little bit different. What is the price point going to be? Why do I back it now on Kickstarter? Why do I back it? That's the whole reason and rationale that you need to know. And three different game modes. So, again, I don't know. It's one of those where we'll see proof is in the pudding execution because it's got all the other stuff it maybe just doesn't have the it factor right now so we'll see if this time is the charm for on ball tournament next up is reputation the board game this is a remake this is a very politically economic push your luck sort of motivated game where the world has been basically taken over by these trillion dollar corporations and you are the head of one of them now it says push your luck it says variable player powers there's not a whole lot of other information on how the game actually plays but they make it very clear that there are going to be two things that you're going to be trying to balance one is your reputation the other is cha ching in case that wasn't clear and the reason that that matters is at the end of the game 
the person with the lowest reputation is just completely eliminated no matter how much profit they've made. So you not only have to manage one, the victory points in that sense, but you also have to manage something else so that the victory points actually get counted in the end in the first place. Now, again, if you click over to Board Game Geek, this is a relaunch from Ninja Star Games. And so the question is going to be, what makes it unique? Again, just like anything else out there, why am I getting this now? Why am I spending my money in this tightly crowded market in this tightly crowded month now compared to other times or now this compared to other games on the market? I don't know, but if you're interested, check it out. Reputation launches also on the 14th. So is Amble Tournament. I forgot to mention that. Next up, also launching on the 14th, is One Deck Galaxy. I know a lot of people have been really clamoring and waiting for this. Uh, the One Deck Dungeon folks that are really a big fan of this style of games. And this is basically the one to two player version that is taking this style of game from Asmati Games into the universe. And what do you need to know about it? Well, it gives you the rule book. There's actually a print and play on the website already. And so you can just head over to the rules and get a good glimpse of what it actually entails already in terms of the home worlds, the societies, the adversaries that you're going to be facing, the standard galaxy deck and everything else that goes along with it. They set it up in very succinct fashion and you get a very good sense of how it is going to play. And so there's not a whole lot of mystery if you're looking at something like this, even if it's over a week or more or less until the actual campaign launch. So what are you doing? Well, you pick a race, you pick a society, you pick an adversary, and you're going through the galaxy deck with cards that are divided into two categories, locations and encounters, locations that you're gonna be trying to claim with influence, which is the core mechanic of this in the first place. And then these give you rewards, parts of rewards, resources, tech upgrades, things like that. The encounters, and as they say here is very important, is that they're not necessarily adversaries, but, they can cause you trouble if you just kind of ignore them for too long. And so again, how does this actually play? You go through the typical sort of cooperative one to two player uh, style of things where your adversary goes, you're discovering, you're doing your actions, and then the results of all of that, and then rinse and repeat. So again, why back now? I believe they had some sort of exclusives. I think they also did, I uh, remember the latest, the one deck dungeon, like the forest one, they did the thick like plastic cards as opposed to just like the regular playing cards. So more sturdy, more long lasting. I think a lot of people actually went for that, but it's a pricier price point, obviously too then. But I mean, here you can read through the whole phases, what you're doing, the different actions, the placing of the dies, the using the tech, uh, combining, returning dice, everything that you're gonna need to know for being able to play this using more dice in this one, it appears than with the previous ones. So is that going to appeal to you? What is the price point going to be? Is it gonna be significantly different than the previous campaigns? And are they going to offer a bunch of the other stuff from the previous campaigns in this one? We'll see when it launches on the 14th. Now, next up, I would be amiss if I didn't include right in the middle here. This is Master of the Universe Clash for Eternia from Simon. There's already gameplay out. Board Game Co. and Quackalope had their stuff out like a week or two ago. So you already can get a glimpse of what the gameplay actually looks like. It's launching on the 14th at 3 p.m. because Tuesdays at 3 p.m. is sort of what they've gone with over the past couple of years. I don't know. You know as just as much as I do on that side of things. But the, the glimpse of this and the interesting aspect of things is that if you haven't or you don't know anything else about it, it's taking a different approach than what Archon Studios did last month with Masters of the Universe. They are taking a more of a 1v all approach. And now the, the interesting aspect of this is they're using a similar system to the Rise of Moloch, if you're familiar with that previous Simon campaign. Because that was probably one of the most underrated, underappreciated uh, gems of a game that I have seen in the last 10 years, especially from a dungeon crawl side of things. It's a 1v all and it has this unique mechanism system where the more actions that the good guys take, it gives more uh, power essentially to the bad guy in that game. The one, if you will, more in this setting is gonna be more applicable. So one side, the all takes more actions. It gives the one person a lot more ability and maneuverability in that sense. And so that's the dynamic that they use to balance it out. Now the interesting and the different thing on this side of things you need to be aware of is not only is this a one V all, which is going to turn some people off, but it is also either side can be the one. The bad guy can be the one, Skeletor can be the one, or He-Man can be the one. So however you want to do it from that side of things is also nicely flexible. Now the other difference that they say in this game as opposed to 
Rise of Moloch, or Rise of Moloch, when the, the all team, the good guys in that sense, with the all team had to have four. And with this, apparently, you do not need to have four, which is really, really nice not to try to have to scale things. And so if that's the case, I really give them a lot of kudos. Now, how contained is Simon going to be? How many different expansions, play mats, coins, upgrade components, expansions are there? Uh, the over under I'm putting at right now, the over under is seven. Are there going to be more or less than seven? I think seven is a safe number because, yeah, we'll go with that. So let me know what you think in the comment section on that regard. That's if you're paying attention to the video section. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be watching it. I'm not a big Masters of the Universe fan. I, I, I Frankly speaking, the IP does nothing for me. I want to know what more about the gameplay. I want to know more about why I'm going to get this because unlike Ankh, Unlike some of the zombie sides, this has much more appeal to me as a 1v all fan. Now, I have two other Simon 1v alls that don't get played enough in the first place. The previously mentioned Rise of Moloch, as well as the others, which are both great games. But there's some balance issues, especially with the expansions. And frankly speaking, I have too much of it already. So is this going to take the place of one of them? Is it going to appeal more? I really don't need more unpainted plastic gray chunks sitting up in my closet either, taking up space. But... From an exclusivity standpoint, you know Simon, you get it during the campaign or you pay a hefty, hefty premium. So that's going to be interesting to tell how it compares, especially from the Archon Studio side of things. Uh, I believe there is an exclusive uh, Orcon, uh, the little mage dude. Um, that's what theirs was too. I guess there's going to be a Master of the Universe castle. I'm not sure what they're going to be doing with it. It's like another dice tower like Archon Studios did. Who cares? But it's going to be interesting to see how they make it different and what the emphasis is as they slowly drag out the expansions uh, every couple of days to give that uh, theoretical boost as opposed to just telling us all at the beginning what it's going to offer, which honestly, I just wish they would do because that would just be super refreshing for once. Um, so I give a lot of credit to all those other campaigns that do that in the first place. But anyway, Masters of the Universe, Simon, probably going to be the most watched of that day launching, but don't be fooled. There are other big ones launching that day too. And let's talk about them as well. Look, we're just going to go straight through several of the games from my top nine to know in the ninth month of that video from previously at the beginning of this month. And number two in that sense is going to be Verdant. Verdant? 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 Verdant, I think is what it was. Someone corrected me in the comment section. You know I'm going to mispronounce something in this video. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a liege video. Anyway, so this is from the amazing Flat Out Games and Beth Sobel illustrating again. $29 price point plus shipping. Uh, so the same as Calico as well as Cascadia, which I was a huge fan of. And this is taking more of a plant-based approach where you have all of these plants and you're going to be trying to coordinate the differences and the asymmetries of them in a arrangement style in order to maximize your efficiency in terms of points. And frankly speaking, it just looks freaking amazing because if you look at this image that I showed last week as well, all of these appear to be different. There appears to be no overlap when we talk about the beginning of the video with Amble Tournament uh, not having any overlap. I don't see any duplicates here in the small production size here. And so if this is anything like Cascadia, I mean, this is probably, I hate to say it, this is probably the closest thing for a lock for me uh, next week of anything, even though I'll be frank with you guys, I don't really like the aesthetic. I recognize the art for how good it is, but frankly speaking, I just don't like it either. But um, that's also if the gameplay outplays <laughs> the artwork, it's going to be also uh, very hard for me not to back because uh, honestly, like no matter how pretty a game is or how not as pretty a game is, gameplay wins, period. And so that's what I'm looking at, which is honestly why I like Abstract so much, because uh, the pieces are ugly as heck sometimes, but the gameplay is beautiful in the uh, symmetric, mind-numbing, in a positive way side of things. And so I look at this and I go, if the gameplay stands up anything like Cascadia, especially at that price point, it's going to be a no-brainer. It's going to be the upper hundreds of thousands, if that has anything to do with anything. Uh, and I say that as a $29 game. There's going to be a lot of eyes on this one. And so I'm really excited. Um, I know nothing about the actual mechanisms of the game. I know there's going to be tons of paid previews and not paid previews that are going to be out there when it launches. So it's going to be really interesting to see. And it's probably, like I said, the most uh, likely game for me to be actually backing and keeping a pledge for of anything uh, so far this month. So that is Verdant. And check it out when it launches on the 14th. 
Next up we have, now this picture doesn't really do it justice, but this is Altenor Secrets. Now why am I talking about Altenor Secrets as it's launching on the 14th as well, as you can see a little bit of what the board looks like, is because this is a little bit of a different spin, haha, <laughs> on things. Uh, because again, on my list of nine to know for September, this would made it because what you're doing is you're having these rotating rings with a number of certain sections and you're going to be battling and trying to acquire points and uh, capture certain areas uh, on these rings as they're moving against another team. And so that's the interesting aspect of it because we don't really see a moving ring side of things. I think there actually though is one that's going to be similar, the City of Great Machines or something like that later this month, but is using a similar mechanism, but completely different because that's more steampunk. This is more fantasy. And so it's going to be interesting to see what you can do uh, with this action as part of a ever shifting dynamic apart from what's going on in the controlled chaos between teams in the first place. Now, they say there are only six ways to score points, which actually sounds actually like a lot, like only six, but there are only four rounds. And so that's going to be the interesting dynamic. Now, they actually reached out to me after I did the nine and nine and uh, wanted to know if I would be interested. Uh, I said yes, but I haven't heard back yet. So I don't think I'm going to have anything by the time the campaign starts, but maybe I will be able to have something by the time the campaign ends for you guys of a little bit of a hands on. What do I think from that side of things? But as I said, it is launching on the 14th check it out if you're interested as something again completely different now speaking of things again completely different we are going to another one that i covered in the ninth uh nine and this is keep the heroes out now this is a completely different game this is a sort of a reverse dungeon defense game a reverse tower defense if you will where you are actually playing as the bad guys the monsters if you will where you are trying to prevent the heroes from getting your loot. The rule book is already out on Board Game Geek, so if you want to check it out, it is out there for you to glimpse. There are predetermined scenarios and uh, levels that you can kind of give in terms of the rule book telling you exactly what to do, uh, the nuances, uh, the mechanics. Now, there only look to be about four, I think, monsters in the base game from what the rule book sort of stated, so I wonder if that's going to be different. I wonder, again, from a smaller indie publisher, what are the stretch rules going to be? What is the incentive going to back it now? And is it going to be priced correctly? Because with a game like this, that would be my biggest concern, is if it's overpriced or if it's not even overpriced, because we know that price inflation is going up across the board. If it is priced reasonably for what people think they are getting, it will motivate people to back it because it's definitely got this cute aesthetic. It's definitely got a different vibe than a lot of other games I've played or even seen lately. So I really like it from that side of things with ingenuity. And if you've heard me say this in any videos, I haven't said it in a while, but I think it's worth saying and repeating over and over again, reward ingenuity from small companies. You just do. So... I think that's why I wanted on my watch list of my games to know and my games to keep an eye out because I could see this going either way. I could see it being more like on ball tournament where, you know, they, they put out like a $70,000 goal and they're getting 20,000 and the price point is about 20 bucks higher than I think it maybe ought to be. Or I could also see them having like a 20,000 goal and having a 50 or $60 price point for a great deal on everything and blowing it out of the water at 50 or $60,000 in the first couple of days too. So I wouldn't be surprised by either side of things with that, but that is keep the heroes out on launching on the 14th. Check it out. Now, next up on the 14th, I'm going to talk about this because it's using some similar mechanics, but it's more of a war style game. It looks like this is the Red Bernus uh, where the French are invading Algeria in 1857. Now, they say that it's going to be uh, deck building and area control mechanics. Uh, so it's looking a little bit different than your typical war game when you see this theme. There is next to no information on Bergen Geek, but the interesting thing you have to know about in this actually one to four player co-op game and that's the other difference that i think puts it outside of the regular war games is you are the defenders the french are the automa where you are just having to outlast the automa deck that's the goal of the game and so it's just an outlast and out survive not a beat as the defending forces and so it's going to be interesting to see how they accomplish this and with a completely different theme than i'm used to seeing with a deck building game so uh red Bernus, that's all we know but check it out when it launches on the 14th now, next up, we have Dog Park, which is also launching on the 14th. Now, they call this game a set collection with point-to-point -point moving. Frankly speaking, again, like, I'm not actually a dog person, so it does nothing for me from that side of things. I know, right? Gasp. Side note here, I'll do my rambling uh, since we're talking about dogs. Uh, my wife uh, gave me an ultimatum about three years ago, and she's like, I either want another kid or I want a furry kid. And I said, well... <laughs> I uh, at that point we had two cats and I said well I know which one I'm going for and we had a third kid who's now a year old um but she has uh, persisted nevertheless uh because uh she wants a dog 
she wants a dog again because before we had the two cats, we had a dog as well. And the only thing I have relented to is I want a Pomsky. Anyway, I want a Pomsky. Like I want one of those miniature uh, Huskies. I want one of those miniature Huskies, but they're expensive as all get out. And I am frugal as all get out. So <laughs> non-board game related frugal. Uh, so anyway, total side note there. But what do you need to know about Dog Park now that we're talking about dogs? So the interesting thing on in this game is there are sort of three, if four-ish phases. The first phase is where you're basically bidding uh, on an auction phase uh, to help get the set collection in the first place. And there's two rounds of bidding where you are actually bidding victory points, it says, in order to get the dogs that you want to board into your kennel. And then the second phase is choosing the dogs that you want to go out and take for a walk and sort of 2a is that and 2b is you're actually going out on the walk and you're going to be interacting with you know various things along the path i'm assuming that's what it's in the middle of this sheet right here and so that is going to be earning you points uh, based on how they're interacting and what bonuses they may have and then the last one is sort of the home phase where you either get points for the ones you took out but also potentially lose points for the ones you didn't if uh you need to so that is the crux of the game. I know, again, a lot of people are hyping this and a lot of people are really liking the artwork. Again, the artwork, it's beautiful, but it's definitely not my appeal or my style. So um, it'll be interesting to see, again, as a card game, what is the price point going to be on something like this and could easily be the make it or break it. If you pop over to the video page here, you can see that there's a couple uh, overviews right here, as well as uh, a bunch of Dino Designer diaries. So uh, check it out if you're interested. And um it's coming from Brewdwood Games. It's launching on the 14th. There you go. Next up, the last one launching on the 14th, I believe, is Sushi Boat. And this is from Japanime Games. And a side note here again as well. Like, Japanime seems to be, like, really holding their cards close to their vest lately. Like, and, and I guess I don't get this with a lot of companies, but I guess they just stick out in my mind recently. Like, like their last campaign of that trilogy of games, um, it's like they, they announce it, like, a day or two before. And... You wonder why it's having trouble funding. You wonder why it doesn't get as much money. It's because you're not getting any of that hype. You're not letting people know that they can anticipate it. And a lot of people aren't Kickstarter junkies like me, although most of you probably are. But, you know, like I constantly am looking at the new page. I'm constantly looking at the popularity page. So I'm seeing stuff when it launches, but a lot of people aren't. And so if you don't tell people it's launching, they're not going to look for it. If they don't look for it, they're not going to back it. And if they don't back it, you're not going to get as much money. I mean, it's simple X, Y, Z. So if you don't tell people like me that it's launching and you don't get it out to me early enough, or I have to go digging around for it and I can't find it in time for this video. I mean, I'm giving you free advertisement here, people. Free advertisement. Free advertisement. Okay. Now that we've got that out of the way, what are you doing with Sushi Boat? Um, I mean, it's Sushi. The conveyor belt, you know, the classic, you know, going along on the ride. Uh, chef creates masterpieces, puts them on the belt. You grab whatever you want. It's sort of a set collection. And they say hidden victory points, which is really interesting there. And slide and push, whatever that is. So each turn, you get your actions. Uh, you get your stuff off the belt. Pay for staff. Buy more dishes. Eat. Stack the plates in front of you. Score points by eating off matching plates. And you never know when somebody will start the wasabi challenge. Um... So again, I wish there was more information. I think Japanime usually has a little bit of information on their website. But again, like if you're launching this game, Japanime, like why don't you have anything up here? There's one box cover here. That's it. Why not having a whole lot of stuff out there? This is the stuff that make or break a campaign sometimes. This is the stuff that makes a difference between funding, barely funding, or you know, getting two or three times your funding goal. And especially as a niche with these Japanime style games. I don't mean that, you know, as a pun or anything, but with this style of artwork, I mean, people already say all the time that they don't like the Japanese style, um, you know, manga artwork. And if you want to get in, you need to get in early with a lot of people and show them what's out there. I don't mean hype it. I don't mean pay. I just mean show. You can put a rule book out. You can make your own gameplay video. Just something else like that would be very helpful in situations like this. So we'll see what happens when it launches on the 14th Sushi Boat. Now, next up on the... 15th, we have Elementa Arcanum. Why am I on their Facebook page? Why am I on their Kickstarter pre-launch page? Because they're not actually on Board Game Geek. Speaking of doing things to get your name out there, I mean, you only have 51 followers because no one knows about it. One to six players, 10 to 60 minutes? Team mode? Solo mode? What am I actually doing? A deck building game with four elements. Okay. Now, that being said, they have the full rule book on their page, but that's about it. I mean, you can scroll through it a little bit in that sense. Attacking, researching, shuffling your deck, winning the game. So 
So what is this game um, without any uh, images? So the basic setup of this game is that you have three sort of rounds. And you can divide it up however you want, but there are numbers basically of, what is it, 2 to 12s of each of these four different deck elements. And so what you need to know is that there's a tier that you're going to be starting with in sort of your starting cards, your 2s, 3s, and 4s, and then the add up to the tier 1 is 5s, 6s, and 7s, and then you have 8s, 10s, and 12s. And all you're going to be doing essentially is of these four different elements is you have a starting hand of five cards, and you play basically going back and forth. I play cards, you play cards of one element. You add up the number that they are of one element. You can play as many as you want of just one element, and then the defender has the ability to block it with a different element, uh, or if it is not an element that can block it well, or oppose it as the um, basic elements say, you know, earth opposes wind, wind opposes earth, fire and water, that sort of thing, then they only use the half value and then you take damage. And then at the end of your turn, you can use leftover spells in your hand to buy some of those higher spells at the higher tiers that you need. And then you shuffle up, rinse and repeat. And I mean, that's basically what it is in that sense. And then there's two different um, levels as well that you can do in terms of the advanced game. So again, that's basically what it is. And there's also team rules and multiplayer. You don't need me to read that. But that's the gist of it. And again, it's relatively straightforward and simple, but are people going to be interested in it? And that's just what I don't know when it comes to something like this. It almost seems a little bit too light. And like I just mentioned with Onball Tournament, is it just too low of overhead and too crowded genre already in the first place? I don't know. We'll see when it launches and we'll see what happens with Elementor Arcanum launching on the 15th. Now, speaking of things that are relaunching again, we have Three Tail. Three Tail is launching, relaunching on the 16th. Now, if you remember this before, I talked about this as one to kind of keep an eye on it, but the interesting and the most concerning aspect was, as you may guess by the name Three Tail, you need three players now interesting now on the board game geek page it says one to three so is it going to allow you to scale or does it run into the other issues that i talked about that masters of eternia is avoiding in terms of you playing as one person but you still need to play as three characters is it going to allow that i mean that's the other concern because it goes in sort of this past present and future phases that determine what actions you're trying to take and the destiny that goes along with it as well as the drafting and the deciding of the powers and and just all of that and i think it's a very interesting concept and i think that they did better than i would have expected but obviously not nearly as well as they expected and i think people were saying that the price point was relatively high uh, for what the concern was that you were getting in that sense. You know, they talk about it. Okay, so prophecy phase, then past, present, and future. Um, but, you know, basically, okay, so past, you're developing your character. Great. Then you're entering battles, quests, treasures, artifacts. Uh, present phase, prophecies are going to get fulfilled. Future comes, and all the backstory and the wing conditions get revealed. So, again... Uh, I think the concept is there, but I think the price and the execution were the trouble. And so we'll see uh, what happens when it comes around on the 16th again, especially now that it's, frankly speaking, probably going up against heavier competition with everything else going on. So uh, I'll be interested to see what happens. I'll be interested to see what differences that they make. Uh, but ultimately, I think that's going to be the big make it or break it on whether or not they succeed this time around. So if you're interested, again, 3Tail relaunching on the 16th. Last up. On the 16th also, we have Collab. Now, this is a very interesting game because it is a dice worker placement game with some take that. Interested? Let's talk. So, it is a dice worker as well as a dice placement, dice collection style of game where you are going to be making fancy and powerful potions, creating fancy monsters, doing more research to outperform your fellow Collab Industries scientists. The gist of it is you're going to be sending these minions out, one going out to get resources per turn and one coming back bringing in resources per turn that you're going to be utilizing. And as the game grows, as the game progresses, you're going to have more locations and locations with more abilities uh, or resources or things to do at said resources uh, to take advantage of. I mean, all in all, it looks like a very interesting premise. Again, as you heard me say in the roundup this past week, dice worker placement is one of the few things that's really going to pique me from a worker placement style of things, especially as a dice collection and the uh, just the rolling side of things and how it influences what you can do in each of those locations. I have absolutely no idea what else it is going to look like, but as a worker placement game, especially a dice worker placement game, it's a niche. Let's be frank. It's a niche, but it's a niche for me a little bit, but it's not a niche for everyone. Now, the trick is that you're going to be building these creations, and when somebody builds their 12th creation, that is the, the end game statement, if you will. 
And I, I know that there's gonna be a lot of videos about this because I think I've seen it making its rounds just very vaguely in the corners of some of the bigger names on social media. And so I'll be interested to see what sort of hype and what sort of uh, endorsement this one has because honestly I have no idea what to do with this one because it also look at this I mean it's also got miniatures again as a worker placement a dice worker placement with miniatures uh, that scares me from a price point standpoint it does because um, even as just these markers for you as the inventor about which areas you're going to be doing and your minions going next to you and doing research next to you um, I have a feeling that the price point is going to be probably at least $70, $80 and that's probably going to price me out for a game whose mechanisms I am sort of on the fence for already. So it'll be interesting to see what it looks like. What are the incentives of getting it now? What are they going to offer? Is it just going to be the deluxe offer? Is it going to be something else exclusive in terms of gameplay? I don't know, but we'll see. And I'm interested to follow it because, um, yeah, like I said, worker placement with dice, 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 me. There you go. Collab launching on the 16th. I'm sorry, that was a long one. That was a lot longer than the last couple of weeks. I mean, there's a lot of games. I mean, what are we like 12 or 13 games this week? So that's intense. Now let's get on to the fun stuff. Let's get on to the TV talk. Uh, I know this is the segment you come for every week. This is the segment you tune in for. Something completely unrelated to board games. Uh, what did I get through? I burned through season three of The Expanse. Boom. Great show. Cannot recommend it enough. Now, season three, especially the very end, uh, was the last two or three episodes were pretty predictable, except for the very end. The very, very end. And if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, no spoilers here. I'm not going to be one of those people. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm I hyped for seeing what season four has. So and I'm trying, I try and stay away from all spoilers. Uh, speaking of spoilers, uh, what if Marvel, what if, are you caught up on that? I'm watching Loki. Uh, I'm getting into the other two Marvel series. I think I'm going to do a dedicated video um, at some point of talking about those dedicated Marvel vi videos and series and seasons and ranking them. You know, I'm maybe getting four episodes in and saying, okay, four episodes in, what do I think of these? How would I rank them? Or all seasons rank them put out there, put my collab out there and see what you guys say in response to that. Speaking of things that totally shook me up and totally were awesome today, uh, on the day of me filming this, uh, the Matrix new trailer for Matrix 4 dropped. That was awesome. I'm super pumped. I, I said to a couple of people on social media, like, if anything is going to get me back into a movie theater, it's only going to be something like that. It's not going to be any of this run of the mill stuff. It's not going to be any of this common stuff. The Matrix. I mean, the original Matrix is probably one of my favorite movies of all time because it's a movie that makes you think. And then after you watch it the first time, you go back and you watch it again and you see how much connects and how much clicks and how much you miss the first time around. Sort of like the first Mission Impossible. Uh, say what you want about Tom Cruise, which you can, but the first Mission Impossible was the same way. It's a thinking movie and there aren't enough of those out there nowadays and so both of those movies are like above or at the top of my all-time favorite movies list for those reasons because they're just that cool to watch and that cool to watch the surprises and the reactions and the connections that you missed the first time or two around uh when you watch them again so that is awesome i'm loving that uh i'm watching the post-mortem as well on netflix it's the swedish um series where a woman in a small town dies and she basically finds out that she's a vampire and that uh it everything sort of spins it's a very it's a dark dramedy and so it's completely different than anything else I've, I've watched recently and it's pretty good i'm also watching on hulu only murders in the building with steve martin martin sheen as well as selena gomez uh, surprisingly funny in, in a, again, a very dark way. It's a, again, a dramedy that is a play on these three people that all live in the same building that are completely unalike that bond over a true crime podcast and a murder that takes place in their building and they try and solve it. And so there are, frankly speaking about halfway through, there are some cringe moments. Like it's not the best series I've watched, but it's above average. And so I'll probably end up finishing it as well. So it's something different if either of those three names uh, does something for you. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of Sheen as much, but uh, Steve Martin, big fan. Selena Gomez, I don't know her from X, Y, or Z, but she's doing a good job so far. So I give her a lot of credit, too, for someone that I wasn't really uh, huge on before this series. So interesting from that standpoint. Uh, again, I'm still trying to get into The Mandalorian. I'm sort of gotten away from that since I went towards the Marvel stuff right now. And, uh, you know... That's about it. That's about it from the TV side of things. What are you guys watching? What are you guys interested this week in backing? 
Uh, which of these appeals to you? Because I just went through like a dozen games. So what has got your eye? What has got your wallet captured? What are you going to be leaning on, banking on, hoping on, or hoping not to see? And we'll just kind of go from there. As always, uh, help me get to 5,000 by the end of 2021. And uh, hopefully I'll have the year anniversary uh, special short up for you guys tomorrow. So I really appreciate you guys being with me this whole time. This has been an amazing ride so far, and I just can't wait to go further. So thank you. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Stay classy. Have a great day. See you around in the comments section.